Chapter 10 of Jetta of the Lowlands by Ray Cummings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Murder in the Garden. Hans, keep back. I will go. But, Commander, armed. The hell he is not. Spawn said no. Spawn. Where is Spawn? He was here. I had dropped back from the window, and gripping Jetta, stood in the center of the room. Jetta, dear. Oh, Philip, there's no other way out of here? No, no. Only the heavy sealed door and this broken window. The bandits in the garden had paused at sight of me. Someone had called. He may be armed, Debir. They had stopped their forward rush and darted into the shelter of the pergola. I might be armed. We could hear their low voices not ten feet from us, but I was not armed except for my knife. Futile weapon, indeed. Jetta, keep back. If they should fire, I got a look through the oval. De Beer was advancing upon it, with his barreled projector half leveled. He saw me again. He called. You, American, come out. I crouched on the floor, pushing Jetta back to where the shadows of the bed hid her. You, American. He was close outside the window. Come out, or I'm coming in. I said abruptly, Come. My blade was in my hand. If he showed himself, I could slash his throat, doubtless. But what about Jetta? My thoughts flashed upon the heels of my defiant invitation. Suppose as De Beer climbed in the window, I killed him. I could not escape, and his infuriated fellows would rush us firing through the oval, sweeping the room, killing us both. But Jetta was in no danger. Her father was outside, and these bandits were her father's friends. I would have to yield. I called louder. Why don't you come in? Could I hold them off, frighten them off, for a time, and make enough noise so that perhaps someone passing in the nearby street would give the alarm and bring help? There was a sudden silence in the patio. The bandits had so far made as little commotion as possible. Presently, I could hear their voices. I heard an oath. De Beer's head and shoulders appeared in the window oval. His leveled projector came through. Perhaps he would not have fired, but I did not dare take the chance. I was crouching almost under the muzzle, so I straightened, gripped it, and flung it up. I then slashed at his face with my knife, but he gripped my wrist with powerful fingers. My knife fell as he twisted my wrist. His projector had not fired. It was jammed between us. One of his huge arms reached in and encircled me. Damn you! He muttered it, but I shouted, Fool! De Beer! The bandit! I was aware of a commotion out in the garden. Bring all Narita on our ears. De Beer, shut him up. I was gripping the projector, struggling to keep its muzzle pointed upwards. With a heave of his giant arms, De Beer lifted me and jerked me bodily through the window. I fell on my feet, still fighting, but other hands seized me. It was no use. I yielded suddenly. I panted. Enough. They held me. One of them growled. Another shout and we will leave you here dead. Commander, look. My shirt was torn open. The electrode band about my chest was exposed. The beer towered head and shoulders over me. I gazed up, passive, in the grip of two or three of his men, and saw his face. His heavy jaw dropped as he gazed at my little diaphragms, the electrode. He knew now, for the first time, that this was no private citizen he had assaulted. This official apparatus meant that I was a government agent. There was an instant of shocked silence. An expression grim and furious crossed the giant bandit's face. So this is it. Hans, careful, hold him. Jetta was still in her room, silent now. I heard Spawn's voice close at hand in the patio. De Beer, careful. It was the most cautious of half-whispers. Abruptly, someone reached for my chest, jerked at the electrode, tore its fragile wires. 
the tiny grids and thumbnail amplifiers, jerked and ripped and flung the whole little apparatus to the garden path. But it sang its warning note as the wires broke up. Up in Great New York, Hanley knew then that catastrophe had fallen upon me. For a brief instant, the crestfallen bandit mumbled at what he had done. Then came Spawn's voice. Got him to beer? Good. Triumphant Spawn. He advanced across the garden with his heavy tread, and to me, and I am sure to the beer as well, there came the swift realization that Spawn had been hiding safely in the background. But my detector was smashed now. It might have imaged the beer assailing me. But now that it was smashed, Spawn could act freely. Good, so you have him. Make a way to the mine. I did not see De Beer's face at that instant, but I saw his weapon come up and act wholly impulsive, no doubt, a flash of fury. He leveled the projector, not at me, but at the oncoming Spawn. You damn liar. De Beer. It was a scream of terror from Spawn, but it came too late. The projector hissed, spat its tiny blue puff. The needle drilled Spawn through the heart. He toppled, flung up his arms, and went down, silently, to sprawl on his face across the garden path. De Beer was cursing, startled at his own action. The men holding me tightened their grip. I heard Jetta cry out, but not at what had happened in the garden. She was unaware of that. One of the bandits had left the group and climbed into her room. Her cry was now suppressed, as though the man's hands went over her mouth, and in the silence came his mumbled voice. Shut up, you. There was the sound of a scuffle in there. I tore at the men holding me. Let me go. Jetta, come out. De Beer dashed for the window. I was still struggling. A hand cuffed me in the face. A projector rammed into my side. Stop it, fool American. De Beer came back with a chastened bandit ahead of him. The man was muttering and rubbing his shoulder, and De Beer said, Try anything like that again, Cartner, and I won't be so easy on you. De Beer was dragging Jetta, holding her by a wrist. She looked like a terrified, half-grown boy, so small was she beside this giant. But the woman's lines of her, and the long dark hair streaming about her white face and over her shoulders, were unmistakable. His daughter, De Beer, was chuckling, the little Jetta. All this happened, in certainly, no more than five minutes. I realized that no alarm had been raised. The bandits had managed it all with reasonable quiet. There were six of the bandits here and the beer, who towered over us all. I saw him now as a swaggering giant of thirty-odd, with a heavy-set, smooth-shaved, handsome face. He held Jetta off. Damn how you've grown, Jetta. Someone said, she knows too much. And someone else. We will take her with us, if you leave her here, De Beer. Why should I leave her? Why? Leave her for Perona? I think that for the first time Jetta saw her father's body lying sprawled on the path. She cried, Philip. Then she half turned and murmured, Father. She wavered, almost falling. Father. She went down, fainting, falling half against me and against the beer, who caught her slight body in his arms. Come, we'll get back. Drag him. But you can't carry that girl out like that, De Beer. Into the house there's an open door. Hans, go out and bring the car around to this side. Give me the cloaks. There is no alarm yet. De Beer chuckled again. Perona was nice to keep the police off the street tonight. We went into the kitchen, an auto car, which to the village people might have been there on Spawn's mining business, slid quietly up to the side entrance. A cloak was thrown over Jetta. She was carried like a sack and put into the car. I suddenly found an opportunity to break loose. I leaped and struck one of the men. 
but the others were too quickly on me. The kitchen table went over with a crash. Then something struck me on the back of the head. I think it was the handle of De Beer's great knife. The kitchen and the men struggling with me faded. I went into a roaring blackness. End of chapter 10